Non-probability sampling methods. Remember, non-probability sampling methods are what you need to use if you don't have a sampling frame and there's no way to know the odds of selection of each element in your sample. So I guess you can see this is pretty important, but I'm going to say it again. You use a non-probability sampling method when you have no sampling frame, no complete list of all possible elements that go into your sample. The odds of selection are not known. Remember, even if you know the total population in terms of number, if you don't have a list of everyone in that population, you don't have a sampling frame. You're going to want to use a non-probability method when the total population is unknown or unknowable. You'll also want to use a non-probability sampling method if constructing a sampling frame is too cost, time, or resource prohibitive. And finally, many people use a non-probability sampling frame for a small-scale study or a test study. The primary drawback to non-probability sampling methods has to do with generalizability. Non-probability sampling methods are not generalizable. Even though in this class we're going to use statistics to make estimates, in reality you shouldn't do that. We can't estimate error. We don't know the odds of selection. Therefore, we can't really generalize to a larger population. We can only really make statements about our sample. Our sample may or may not be representative. As I just said, we can't estimate error. We can't draw a graph showing the area in which we expect the true population parameter to fall. In this lecture, I'm going to cover four non-probability methods. Convenience, also called availability sampling, quota sampling, purposive, also called judgmental sampling, and snowball sampling. First, I want to summarize again why you would choose to use a non-probability sampling method. Perhaps the cost of developing a sampling frame is too high, or you don't have enough time, or you lack the available resources. Perhaps the total population is unknown. Finally, the sample may be adequate if you don't need to generalize your findings. For example, if we want to do something to improve something about our department, we aren't going to be generalizing to other departments. We just need a sample of our students. Maybe I'm just testing questions for reliability or validity, or I'm just pre-testing a questionnaire. The simplest method of survey distribution is what's called availability or convenience samples. They're also sometimes referred to as haphazard or accidental sampling. In availability or convenience sampling, elements are selected because they're, they're there and they're willing to take your survey. In some cases, they're done by what we call a captive audience, such as a sociology or psychology undergraduate class. You've got a bunch of people in a room and you ask them all to do a survey. It could also be a volunteer sample. One of the big drawbacks to availability sampling is that it's not very representative. As you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of response bias. Our friends and family members who are willing to do our survey probably don't look a whole lot like the general population. You should also keep in mind that even if you do things to mitigate the fact that it's a convenient sample, for example, if I were to do a convenient sample of students here on campus, I might go to several locations on campus and count every fifth student to come out the door of the building and ask them to do my sample. I might do this at three or four different times of day to try to get students who come in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. But ultimately, it's still an availability or a convenient sample and has some significant drawbacks. Quota sampling is the non-probability equivalent of stratified sampling. This will make more sense after you listen to the next unit. In quota sampling, you recruit subjects to fill a particular quota. For example, I might want to represent racial categories in proportion to how they appear in the larger population. The important thing to remember about quota sample sampling is I'm trying to match something up about my sampling population to the larger population. I'm not just picking out particular people. 
With quota sampling, you want to be careful of response bias. Because of response bias, you may get what is called a false homogeneity effect. This means that the people it's easy to find who fill your quota will be overrepresented in your sample, as opposed to people who might be a little bit more difficult to locate. In addition, in order to perform a quota sample, you need to know these characteristics about the general population. I could, alternatively, set my quotas to at equal points. I might, for example, say I'm going to just go out in the quad and make sure that my sample contains 25% freshmen, 25% sophomores, 25% juniors, and 25% seniors. With purposive or judgmental sampling, I'm selecting elements because of their unique position. In this case, I'm asking people to participate in my survey because they meet a very explicit criterion that's probably tied into my theory. For example, if I'm interested in altruism, I might only ask people to participate if they've given to charity. I'm, ask, I'm screening based on some sort of criterion. This is different than quota sampling. With quota sampling, I'm trying to represent some, some sort of something in equal proportions or in proportions relative to the larger population. With judgmental sampling, I'm only taking a certain group of people. Snowball sampling. Snowball sampling is when you, you're connected with one or more members of an interconnected but hard to find population and you use those people to help you find other members of the community. This works really well if you're talking to people who are hard to reach but interconnected. Researchers who are interested in network theory also use snowball sampling. It's most often used for in-depth interviews. For example, I was interested in talking to women who play non-traditional sports. Women who play sports that traditionally men are more encouraged to play. Well, obviously, there's no list of these people. So I went to a social event at a local bar for a women's professional football team. I introduced myself to what looked like a women's professional football player. Funnily enough, she, she was there to meet a women's professional football player, but she was actually a rugger. Well, that was great. Now I had a connection to a rugby team, and I still had the opportunity to meet the female football players. I got over 40 interviews just from finding a few people who had friends who also played non-traditional sports. So to sum it up, despite lacking generalizability, non-probability methods may be necessary to study populations for which the total number is unknown, to study new phenomenon, for preliminary studies, or for qualitative methods.